This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Mercier's. And I'm Nate Blyton. And welcome back, everybody, this week. We took a week off last week, which we don't do very often, so thanks for hanging in with us. Our guest this week is self-proclaimed music theorist and composer... Uh, Richard Herman, who is a professor at the University of New Mexico, and I took some great classes from him while I was there, just as full disclosure. Um, Rick, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, I asked Rick to be on the show initially because I had been um, chewing on the idea for a while that we should have a theorist on the show, because composers all can talk about theory some, but as I said... Um, Rick is a, is a good composer, but he is a, also a self-proclaimed or, you know, self-identifies as, as a music theorist. And, uh, it's, uh, I, I personally have a lot of questions about sort of music theory and the future of music theory and what it means to composition, um, now, uh, you know, because, um, new music has changed a lot and become a lot more eclectic. And, uh, I've just got some questions about the way music theory speaks to that. Um, so Rick, the, the, uh, the big thing that I wanted to talk about was music theory in education. Um, we've all gone through, uh, <laughs> at least a full regiment of, uh, undergraduate music theory. Um, and I was wondering, and, and I know that there's no way you can speak for, for music theory across the board. No one knows everything that's going on. Um, but one question I have is about the way, because I'm going to be, there's a good chance I'm going to be teaching some collegiate music theory coming up real soon. Yes. And, uh, and I was wondering about music theory and how it's taught, at least in the United mm -hmm. States. And if you have any idea, is it wildly different in different areas? Are people uh, adopting some, some radically different models that uh, in some way tip their hat to the shift in the way new music is the, the you know, I, I guess a, a, a in reference to the way new music and the way it's generated has changed over the past couple of decades? Well, basically, you have to go back down to some definitions of what theory is. I take a broad view following, of all people, Aristotle, where he divides things into people who create the artwork, people who, another group, who perform, and a third group who reflect upon what's been done. So if you take that broader view, theory would also encompass, say, a clarinet professor who's reflecting and teaching on what the theory of playing clarinet is. So the notion of what a theorist is automatically is problematic and is drawn too narrowly. As for how it's taught across the nation, uh, it's more, I think, has to do with um, or another variable on that one is also the type of institution where theory is being taught. So for instance, large state universities tend to do things one way. Private liberal arts colleges with strong music traditions do things another way. High quality research universities, be they private or public, do things yet another way. and. You might also think about junior colleges, and they do things yet another way. And that's a topic of my music theory pedagogy course, is to figure out what the philosophy of the institution is, and then from there, fit in a broader notion of what theory is into the philosophy of that institution. So yes, things are radically different. Also, the people who are teaching it are radically different. There are very few institutions in which people can go and study with a Ph.D. music theorist. Usually it's taught by all kinds of people who have a greater or lesser knowledge and engagement and interest in the topic. You guys have big fights about who's gonna, how you're going to handle a Cadential 6-4 as a suspension or not? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a waste of time. That's that old law. <laughs> I would say use your ears. Does this sound more dissonant? or less dissonant? And what are the implications of that? I put it out that way and so, let people think. So in your, in your discussion of some of those different kinds of uh, teaching music theory, it, one thing that you, you kind of hinted at was the utility of, of the discipline of music theory. 
And so I'm, I'm wondering uh, if you could maybe explain expand on that a little bit more uh, of how those different institutions see the the usefulness of music theory as a discipline or as as an activity as an analysis as an activity well boy that's um, not an easy one to answer concisely uh, <laughs> but I we, don't, say, don't be concise we, we hate concise <laughs> oh all right uh, <laughs> I think utility is a value and an important value for most programs, but not all. For instance, if at, you're at a conservatory, it's the only value. If you're at a high-level research university, it may have almost no value. Most institutions fall somewhere between those on the, on the continuum that they form the poles of. So utility um, is important to me personally because I've made a bad living as a performer at one time. Uh, I am still active as a composer, and I interact with performers. So for me, utility is personally of importance. Even though as a scholar I've published things that may not at first blush appear to have any utility. So in the kind of institution I'm in, that a large state university, they usually have trouble understanding who they are and what their goals are and are very confused. And if you ask any three faculty members, you'll get several different answers on that issue. So for me, I find it kind of fun being able to serve uh, the needs of people going on and becoming real scholars. Uh, one of my former master's students this fall will join Columbia as a member of their theory faculty, Mariusz Kozak, and congratulations oh. to him. Mariutz, nice. That's right, yeah. So I have that population to serve, and we really do have a lot of people coming out of our program going to great PhD programs on full rides. So that is one segment of my population that I'm able to serve. But I also personally feel it important to be able to speak to uh, the performance major there and also the music ed people, because in another part of my life, I was less at a junior high school band director. <laughs> Fortunately, for a very short period of time. Doing the Lord's work. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Well, that's one way of looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> so that so, answers a piece of your question in any event. <coughs> Let's, go ahead, Sam. <coughs> um, well, I was wondering if... Uh, does music theory, the way it's taught, at least to undergraduates, suffer from the fact that, um, like, as an example, I, I, I think that if you were to ask an average undergraduate um, in music to explain what a tempo modulation is to you, there's a good chance that they wouldn't be able to explain you to you what it is. Um, or if they have some idea where it comes from, they still wouldn't be able to calculate one. And that's just a real, a specific example of something that's not harmony. Um, it seems like, you know, a, a very high level of fluency is stressed often in uh, theory programs having to do with common practice harmony. And, you know, common practice harmony is getting further away with each passing minute, right? Um, well, why do you equate that with theory? Co well, well, common practice harmony? Yeah. Well, that's when you take a theory class as an undergraduate, that's what you learn. Ah, so when you take a politics class and you get politicians, do they uh, act uh, in the best uh, theoretical and philosophical uh, uh, means of politics? Mm -hmm. No, but they will act in no. a philosophical means. Maybe not the best. <laughs> right. Well, the sort of the same thing. Remember, music theory is taught by mostly non-music theorists. Right. The curriculum are mostly not designed or are importantly limited by non-music theoretical concerns. Second of all, I'd like to point out in your uh, issue of metric modulation, two things that are important. You do realize that most of our students are from the United States, number one. Right. Two, you do realize their arithmetic skills are lacking compared to the rest of the world. <laughs> Number three, uh, you do notice that, unfortunately, we tend to attract students in music degrees that are math-phobic. 
So mm -hmm. when you start, not all of them, certainly, to be sure. But when you add that which is brew together, you get a lot of strange things and strange attitudes that I don't think are worthy, certainly, of research universities. Right. Or the field of music theory. So we have this sort of strange animal loose on the land that I'm not sure is terribly helpful to many people, nor in the best interests of, if you go back and read these institutions' actual mission statements, lines up very well that way. Um, do you so, think I, that the way that the way uh, theory is approached for undergraduate uh, institutions, and, and I realize that's a very broad uh, set of, of institutions, but do you think there are any fundamental ways that it's different now, generally, than the way it was, say, when you were going through undergraduate school? Hard to say, because the institutions are very different, and their philosophies are very different of what they're looking for, and hence their faculty members are very different. So, oddly enough, I would say the typical undergraduate program, which is a myth, uh, there is no such thing, Right, hasn't changed a lot, uh, but we have a lot more information, high quality information available, oceans and oceans more than we've ever had. So the good news is, if you have a bad theory teacher, someone not committed to theory, doesn't understand much of it, doesn't understand its import, but it's part of their teaching load, if you're subjected to those kinds of people, if you are truly belong in a university, that means you are actually curious in a reasonably deep way about your field, and shouldn't all of us be if we're going to universities, then you do have a thing called the library and the internet, in which fabulous information is available for your own self-education. And as I tell my younger colleagues, aka students, I've learned far more on my own than I have from the very distinguished programs I've graduated from and continue to learn. I also wonder, uh, this is something I really have no idea about, and, and Rick, you might know or somebody else on the panel might know, but uh, one thing that we learn about in theory classes coming through school are generative models, like serialism as an example. Oh. And you learn that's sort of a, a music, that's a theory of music, if you will, that's about how it was made um, in a way that I think is sort of different than other than, than studying uh, music theory and other aspects. Are there any new um, generative models that you know of that have to do with a way to come up with the frequencies that you're using or anything like that? Well, I think the best music theory work is is, uh, as it always has, has come from composers, not from PhD music theorists. Because composers are passionately interested in a particular kind of technical issue or aesthetic issue. And so they use their um, intelligence and hard work to work out an answer. Usually they don't publish that material, it goes into their their music. After all, would you rather publish a book or an article about music or write another piece of music? And for most composers, the answer is, of course, write another piece of music. And well, a composer, I, I think a composer will often tackle an issue far before a theorist will because the theorist will wait perhaps decades for, for that voice to have been refined and then study it in hindsight. Um, yes, although some theorists actually are ahead of the game, too. I think the notion of composers ahead, theorists behind, uh, is a musicology notion, not a theoretical notion. Uh, so, for instance, uh, there are studies that I've done uh, with the mathematician music theorist Jack Douthit and many others like us around the country, uh, exploring uh, structures of pitch systems that no composers that I know of have thought of or used yet. So there is a speculative side of scholarly music theory uh, that can be turned into, uh, speaking very crudely, or be one of the inputs of a compositional process. So the notion of theory following practice is one of the ways that theory interacts, but far from the only way. And I've been on both sides of that, both writing speculative, 
pure abstract theory on one hand, and also following behind and working things out. So, for instance, on uh, people like Luciano Berrio and Morton Feldman. So that, that's actually leads me to a, a question that, that I had coming into this. And I'm curious. So you, you, you as, we, as Sam said, you self-identify as a theorist, but you also write a fair amount of music. And I'm curious as to what the relationship is between those two activities in your life, how um, your work as a theorist has informed your composition and vice versa. Yeah, l let me uh, say that I'm not a self-identified theorist. You know, <laughs> Rochester's Eastman School of Music should be upon me. Uh, so, and I was hired as a theorist. It's one of the things I do. Uh, I'm a little bit more broad than that. So, but let me back up and, and get to your question, which is uh, an eternal one, it seems, in the West. I, I can't speak for other cultures, obviously. But the interaction is not direct, it's a tool in the toolbox. And if you take the broader view of theory that I do, that is stemming from Aristotle, as reflecting after practice and creation, that gives you a much broader field. And so if you were to check my library, you'd see many, many volumes on instrumental technique. Those are theories of how to play instruments. That's an input too. There, but again, other inputs uh, are non-theoretical in the sense of looking at a beautiful tree or sunset, or hiking on a mountain, or looking at the ocean, or sailing, or reading poetry, uh, which it's not clear if that's theoretical activity or not, according to Aristotle. Probably not, but then I'm not very good at mind-reading ancient Greeks and dead ones at that. So... Uh, but it's one of many inputs. Is it decisive? Maybe for some passages or some pieces, it may be the lead item. In others, it may take a bit of a back seat. But the interesting thing for me, at least, about composition is I don't have a fixed way of working. Every piece seems to have its own way of coming into being. Uh, the rational part of me um, uh, is part of it but there's also the non-rational parts uh, that I try to listen to and um, deal with in some sort of rational process. Because at the end, we have to have, unless we're producing a computer music piece in which we do the entire thing, we, are have to, we, we do need to communicate to performers. And that is a theoretical activity in and of itself. Notation is a theoretical activity in and of itself. So the separation uh, of uh, composition in one side and theory on the other strikes me as utterly artificial. The composers who like to make that uh, differentiation and perhaps might find it politically advantageous to make a strong separation, I think are either conscious manipulators or are fooling themselves. <laughs> no, I think that's an interesting observation, and 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 I agree that the the two activities are much more closely intertwined than than a lot of people like to believe, um, and and I, I I think when when I am writing music, my 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 process often involves um, analyzing the thing that I've just written and finding properties of it that I may not have noticed at first to exploit later as, a, as the piece moves forward. And I, f I feel like composing involves analyzing a lot of your own music uh, almost from the same perspective that you would analyze the music of someone else, um, kind of looking at this, this, this thing that is in, in some ways outside of, of you, the same way that the music of Luciano Berrio is outside of you. Um, unless you're Luciano Berrio, I suppose. Um, <laughs> that's that's a, a, an interesting ob observation. I'm, I'm glad to, to hear you say that. Um, and I, I, I often feel like that's something that, that gets left out of a lot of uh, theory instruction. We keep going back to the academy. Um, sure. And I know we've, we've had a lot of discussions on the show in the past about um, you know, the, the place of the academy in the arts writ large. And that's, 
that's a huge as 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 big a question as I asked you earlier. That's perhaps an even bigger one, um, and I, I, uh, I maybe lost the track of where I was going with that. But um, <laughs> that's okay. Free association is good. <laughs> it's another tool. Yeah. Right. Well, um, so it's yeah. I'm I'm totally lost now. I've well, I've, I've lost myself in my own rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> Rick, a lot of the stuff you've been saying it, it seems very suggestive to me that the the idea of thinking of a theorist, I think that people would think of a quote music theorist as a a, a specialist to a high degree, and you seem to reject that uh, in the extreme. Um, do you think that the academy is receptive to the idea as the theorist as not a specialist? And have there been any big changes? Like, does the uh, the anatomy of a PhD in theory that's coming out right now is that different? Is it adhering to that idea that the theorist is not so much a specialist but a uh, a collaborator and uh, you know grabbing the different things and bringing them together? Well, I'm definitely not a typical music theorist, even though I am a card carrying PhD. <laughs> Uh, I was introduced once at a national conference, fortunately not in front of a session, as this is my friend Richard Herman. He's the wild man of music theory. <laughs> so I would agree with that. I, th and then you put that on your card. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> your reputation precedes you. Yeah, they see uh, your name, you're like, oh. This is yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's interesting. Sometimes if I ask a colleague a question via email, I don't get an answer. <laughs> uh -huh. oh, I think that's a good sign. I will ask I will ask very tough philosophical questions. And I, I do it in the spirit not of uh a, a one upsmanship. But Are you just cold calling it? people <laughs> trying to like no, 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 put no. them on the spot? <laughs> Is that what you do? No, no, no. If that would be fun. Maybe I should try to do that. Like, that I, could be a TV show with puppets or something. The, yeah, the more, I, have, yeah. I have other more interesting things to do in my life than to <laughs> quiz academics. <laughs> okay. What are quiz, you guys doing, by the way, quizzing an academic? You might think. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah. one of the things to try to get back to your, to your question here is I think your point at the music theorists and academic – academia as specialists. Well, so is the clarinet professor. So is the orchestra conductor. So is the teacher of singing. We're all hyper-specialists. Now, uh, one of the problems I have with that is you get very strange notions of what music is in the hands of hyper-specialists. And then they inculcate that in their students, and you have lots of people in academia with very strange, narrowly conscribed, conceived of and uh, limited ideas about what music is. I find that appalling, frankly. So, And I think we've all in, uh, experienced that ourselves in our academic experiences. Yeah. Uh, uh, fortunately, I have not experienced much of that. I've been at institutions where uh, there is a value of people being able to walk and chew gum in music. <laughs> And that has paid benefits. It makes music, um, for me, a wonderful journey of constantly learning new things uh, that are far outside of my discipline, my official discipline and job title. And it makes it more easy for me to communicate with uh, students who are open to learning because I can uh, directly address their experience in some fashion that maybe of some use. And my, of course, sub rosa intention uh, is to turn them into raving intellectuals. <laughs> uh, not really. But to get them to think and to think for themselves and not to accept cheap, easy answers. When you say and, raving intellectuals, are you referring to very enthusiastic intellectuals or crazy intellectuals? Uh, is there a difference? Yeah, right. Perhaps not. <laughs> I'm not sure. At least in my case, there isn't. <laughs> I mean, we all chose this path of doing music. We gotta be a little, little crazy. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So I was wondering about um, 
let's assume I was uh, going into a PhD program in music theory and I want to work on a project that has a high level of, pro like every PhD student, I want to get my stuff published when I'm done spending all this time on it. Um, uh, I would probably in that situation try and figure out what has a high level of probability of being published because in any kind of academic publication, you know, things get hot and people attach to that topic. Um, so what are the things, if you know, that are, what are the hot topics for new research in music theory? Well, there are several that at least I find interesting and that are um, evolving out of trends of the past and gaining, uh, gaining uh, speed, if you will. One of them is a wonderful interest on the world music community, uh, scholars, of adapting music theoretical research tools and creating new ones to deal with music of many, many cultures. I think this is a delight. J. Ron uh, of Toronto, uh, R-A-H-N, has been a big force in that for a long period of time and a wonderful scholar and can, can, can go between many different kinds of music and have very insightful things to say. So that is uh, picking up steam rapidly and is, in my book, very, very welcome. A second area that, again, has been around for a very long time, but it's picking up steam, is ideas on music perception and cognition. And we've had psychologists do that for a very long period of time, extraordinarily badly. And <laughs> finally, in the 1980s, uh, it dawned on them that perhaps they ought to team up with some musicians. And they started doing that. And... Surprise, surprise, the work started getting more and more sophisticated and interesting. There's still a lot of hogwash out there, but there's more and more high-quality work being done. Uh, one of uh, the people we tired since you left, Sam, is a fellow named David Bashwinner, whose uh, bachelor's degree is from Cornell University in psychology, master's from Illinois in composition, and Ph.D. from the University of Chicago in theory. And his interests are music and emotion and how they interact. And he's very interested in film music. That, I think, is a very exciting uh, new avenue, uh, intelligent discussion and thought and empirical testing on that. I don't know if you can hear me. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can. Okay. Um, and I think uh, uh, another interesting issue has been for music theorists to try to come to grips with uh, the new musicology in helpful, fruitful ways. Another direction, uh, it, it's now seeming to lose some pop, pun intended, is, uh, mm -hmm. is rock studies, mm -hmm. uh, popular music studies, and that's now starting to branch out into country music. Of course, when people speak about country music, I always ask them which one. <laughs> but that's starting to happen and I think that's a good thing so there are um, many interests that are not focused on so-called common practice harmony which really ought to be renaissance polyphony because that's been around for many hundreds of years more than common practice harmony uh, thank you Robert Cogan for that insight <laughs> so unfortunately what I don't like about the cognition side of things right now is it's narrowly focused on the common practice period, <laughs> which doesn't frankly need a whole lot more study. I think what's much more interesting would be early music and music of the last about 110 years, which pose some really interesting cognitive issues uh, that I think is worthy of uh, a team of uh, PhD cognitive psychologists and music theorists and throwing it some uh, intellectually precocious composers in that mix, and I think you got some. We've talked about some interesting research on the show before uh, about the uh, connection between familiarity and enjoyment of sounds and how mm -hmm. you can be kind of taught familiarity with a sound that will then lead to enjoyment. There's not that you are being taught to like the thing, but just being taught what the thing is leads you to uh, like it more, which is, I, I thought, a, a really interesting study we talked about, I don't know, two, three months ago, 
Um, so yeah, this, there's some really interesting stuff being done in, in music cognition. I, I, I agree with that. Yeah. Um, it was an NPR story um, about well, some it's NPR. Is, you, you never about, trust popular <laughs> press talking about academic right. articles. Well, it was they were discussing a research project that had been done at a university. I don't remember where, but basically, when your average radio listener hears a minor second, it's not that they think it's ugly; it's that they don't know what it is at all. And then they, if if they're subjected to it over a, a period of time, they recognize it, and they might still find it grindy and yeah. perhaps unpleasant. But that doesn't preclude enjoyment. Well, that it the was, grindiness it was all in context too, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Context yeah, I make another point on that. Uh, sure, uh, sure. Uh, working with string players, they mm-hmm. sort of bowed string players. I, I might add, uh, it's they have very interesting ideas on intonation. So, on so-called dissonant intervals, they tend to make them beat more, acoustically make them more rough, so that the resolution is sweeter. And they're taught that, and they teach their students that. Now, um, if you've heard the... Sam, I I sent you the Scored Who Remembering, a solo violin piece of mine written for David Felberg, which... um, is not just the notion that it works in quotes, but also the notion of playing with um, cognitive abilities and how we process uh, segments of music. It also plays with that on a more sophisticated, non-obvious level. Now, in working with David and working with a solo viola piece that I wrote, um, literally one spot where I had the violas sustaining a major seventh by playing this expressive tuning, the bow was literally jumping off the string because of the uh, beats that were being created. And literally, she could not keep the bow on the string. And I said, no, no, you need to not make that a, nar- uh, a, a wider interval. You need to narrow it a bit. In other words, equal temperament or close to it. And sure enough, what happens? The sound is not acoustically rough. It sounds quite lovely. Of course, I'm prejudiced. <laughs> and the bow is staying beautifully on the string and in control. Same thing happened with the quadruple stops of the violin. When David came in and played it in expressive intonation, if you like, it, it, the instrument was just howling and sounded truly awful, from what I intended, at least. And once I encouraged him to play it in equal temperament, sure enough, these in so-called intense dissonances from a tonal framework no longer sounded acoustically rough, no longer sounded bad, and in fact the chord sounded lovely on the instrument. It just sounded different, and it resonated in a different way. That struck me as an interesting example of something uh, you were talking about earlier, Richard, uh, is, is the uh, study that you have done on instruments themselves and how your library contains a lot of instrumental technique kinds of books and you consider that to be as valuable a part of your theoretical study of musical practice as as anything else that you do which i think is is really interesting um the the and and i think when we listen to uh remembering a little bit later that comes across really clearly that this is a, a very violinistic uh, piece. Um, I, I, I can't imagine it being played on another instrument, which I always think is a, is a, is a, is a really interesting uh, feature for a piece to have. Um, can you maybe say a, a, a little bit more about your, your study of the kind of more physical technical elements of instrumental music? Yes, there are a number of, of areas. First of all, the most valuable experience I had as an undergraduate was as a music ed major, taking all the instrumental methods course and, as part of the degree, studying singing. This immediately put me into the heads of the people that I'm writing for. How does the body move? What do they think about? What is the literature that they've all learned? So that already gives me uh, an edge when picking up these books on technique. 
one of the problems we have as composers in writing for instruments we don't know and haven't studied is learning a whole set of physical behaviors and mental attitudes, not just the information in books that we might read. Recordings are, of course, in many ways, acoustically not representative of reality, which is okay by me. I, I, I'm not terribly bothered by that. But it does point out the necessity uh, and value of playing and singing in ensembles to hear what happens, because recordings are very misleading that way. Yeah. So there are those parts of it. Then the next part of it that I'm working on is the spectral side of it. And I've always been interested in that. I studied with, uh, I had the great privilege of studying with Robert Kogan, who wrote the book Sonic Design and uh, another book, um, New Images of Musical Sound, Harvard University Press. He's one of the pioneers in understanding in a holistic way how spectra combine. Uh, and that, I think, also is, uh, uh, is a very, very interesting study and a very sophisticated one, one that the folks at EARCOM, as you know, uh, have taught us uh, quite a bit about. And it's, uh, so I'm very, using various pieces of software, audio sculpt, so forth, learning how to use those and learning more about the actual acoustic outputs, uh, which are, are another whole dimension of it. So you have the dimension of... First of all, the instrument itself, its behaviors, uh, its attitudes, you have the, the sounds and combinations uh, in, that you can only find out from really working in ensembles and, uh, of various kinds, being around them, acoustically live, and then the spectral characteristics of them. So you can see from my point of view, orchestration classes are hopeless. <laughs> You know, it's uh, it's interesting. It kind of related to that. I um, <clears throat> was videotaping someone a violin player's uh, dissertation, a recital. Di I mean, a uh, what do you call it? A lecture recital, where she plays and then she talks about the pieces, this kind of thing. And uh, setting up the microphones, I was having her. This was Natalie Lowe, by the way. I was having her rip through her part of her piece. Like I said, play the loudest part for me. And so she's grinding away in, a, in an upper position. And if you're writing for violin, you need to sit next to a violinist right next to their hand while they're doing that because violin sounds so sweet and so lovely, but when you're right next to it the way a violinist is, you can hear their fingers like smashing the board, you know, it's so, it sounds violent and, and you know, yeah. nothing like what the experience from 25 feet away is. And, and just that uh, has informed my take on writing for violin a great deal, I think. Those fingers, um, those fingers are little hammers. Yes. Yeah. And they're smashing into that piece of wood very hard and very fast. Yeah, and I, I would say the most I have ever learned about writing for instruments was, like, like Rick, you mentioned, not an orchestration class, but it was working with instrumentalists. And there was uh, a, a great graduate seminar that uh, a, a lot of our teachers, uh, Ricardo Lorenz, taught at Michigan State on composer performer collaboration where you just got composer paired with performer and you worked with them for a semester on a number of small projects and one big uh composition um and it was it was a great experience and and i learned so much about i took the thing actually twice it was offered more than once and he let people take it twice to be paired with a different instrument or a different person uh, and I, I learned so much the first time about writing for voice and the second time about writing for piano. And it was it was fantastic. Uh, Rick, I wonder, you said it, from your perspective, orchestration classes are, are, are not very useful. Um, how would you get that kind of the, the, accomplish the goal of an orchestration class uh, in a different way? Uh, a couple of things. I think your teacher at Michigan State was really on the right track, and that's a terrific way of doing things. Uh, I would back up, however, just slightly and recontextualize your question and, and put it this way. Why don't we have courses that teach people how to write for the voice in choirs? True. We have orchestration, but we don't have choral illustration, <laughs> voice illustration, and that's obscene. Music starts with the voice, in my opinion, and is the impetus. So right there we have a gigantic distortion uh, 
uh, that probably comes from the 19th century conservatory movement and has been uncritically accepted since then. So how now to direct your to more directly answer your question. Um, I learned orchestration in high school by reading a book and writing for people. I didn't need the orchestration class in college. Uh, I was uh, daydreaming or thinking about other things during class. There was no need for it already. I figured that much out. You're quite right that what most important thing is to work with performers closely and I would say perform in ensembles and hear what's going on and ask questions of the people sitting next to you or a few feet away about why this, why that, is this harder than that, uh, what happens if you do this. Uh, usually you'll find people who are interested in sharing what they know with you. And you just have to identify who those people are and forget the rest. <laughs> They're not going anywhere creatively. Right. It's interesting, actually. I feel pretty comfortable, obviously, for clarinet and sax. I feel like I'm bootstrapped on those instruments. Um, but from experience playing in orchestra, you know, the clarinet section is positioned. Everybody's pretty familiar with the way that works. I feel comfortable with horn, which is behind us with oboe, which is to the left, bassoon, which is a little further to the left, and flute, which was usually like right in front of us, because I had so many experiences playing right in the middle of that little pod of instruments. Um, strings, I'm a little more, you know, <laughs> don't feel nearly as confident, but it's due to that direct uh, contact and playing the pieces with my peers sitting around me like that. Um, and, and further, you know, <laughs> Talking about learning orchestration, I think that there's a access to uh, music and scores has gotten so much easier um, over the past decades that you uh, you know you hear something that you think interesting sounds interesting orchestrationally you you listen to it and then you go and look at the score and see how that noise is made. Um, that to me seems like a great model too. That is a very simple thing to do, uh, but doesn't seem to be the way that you're encouraged to do that very much in orchestration class, at least not the orchestration class I took. And I think even even con contemporary music is is a little bit harder to find scores of than, say, Beethoven on, on the web, but you can still find a lot of really useful stuff. It, it may not may not all be for, for free, but uh, we had uh, Jennifer Higdon on the show last year, and one of the things that I thought was really interesting was that she sells study scores of her music, music, which is amazing. Not only does she she sells scores and parts for her stuff for for people to perform from her site, but she also just sells study scores, which I think is really valuable. I wish more composers would would do do things like that. Um, or, or though I will say that. I think most composers would, if you are a composer interested in just studying the work, send them an email and say, hey, can I see the score? I think probably most of them would, would send you uh, a PDF or, or maybe print off a, a smaller version of it for study. So I think that's sure. one, certainly one thing that the, the internet has, has gifted us with. In addition to things like IMSLP, where you can find just about anything in the public domain and probably a few things that aren't quite in the public domain uh, for free. So Yeah, I think store, I, I don't want to give the impression that score study or recordings are unimportant. They are important. However, you, particularly with today's more uh, adventuresome scores, I think the notion of the sound and the symbol are more disconnected than they've been in the past. Mm -hmm. And the problem with recordings are they can be so heavily manipulated that what you see in the score and hear in the recording may not correspond to any reality that might be in an actual concert hall. But you also have to figure in the concert hall. So, for instance, the solo fiddle piece, uh, Remembering, was written for Keller Hall at the University of New Mexico. And it is very friendly to both string instruments and has a lovely reverberation time. So I wrote that piece to take advantage of that, rep of that uh, reverberation time. It has been performed in a number of other spaces, and it works, and it works well. It gets great uh, reaction from a very wide range of audiences. Uh, but it clearly sounds best 
in that hall that it was written for, and we forget about that in our orchestration classes. Now, that's excusable because there's so much to learn, much less taking on that monkey, and that takes some physics, and we're math-phobic, <laughs> many, many, many music people, and physics-phobic, which is really too bad. Well, and I think we often will talk to a performer about even a giant work and say, you know, how do you do this thing? And they're like, you don't really, you kind of just fake it. Um, you know, they, they have uh, like workarounds for some of these things that even very well-known kind of Hall of Fame composers have, uh, have, have, have written that have made it into the canon that never really get played exactly as they wrote it to begin with. So. Right. Well, that's right. We, we don't know everything. And we do make mistakes in a sense uh, of running things that aren't really quite possible to do. And performers, you're right, they, they do workarounds. And I try to be upfront with my performers and say, look, you know the instrument far better than I do or ever will, even with intense study. So I'm going to need your help to keep from writing silly stuff. Right. And, and so there are some, you know, I think in relatively impossible techniques that have been more or less canonized like a quadruple stop on the violin is like there's just that doesn't really happen the way it looks on the page ever like it's just not possible and we've just all kind of agreed that yeah we fake it like this and we all agree that we'll hear it like that and that's that's what quadruple stops are yeah actually if you look at my score of remembering i actually write out how they're broken that's fantastic oh, good. yeah because of just that thing and interestingly enough, there was some resistance from David initially on that because uh, the violinists and perhaps the other uh, bold string instruments think that that's sort of a part of performance practice, that that's part of their realm, not part of yours. That, that you're stepping yeah. on their toes. Exactly. Yes, that's an interesting to uh, uh, issue, actually. When you, Whenever you run into a situation where what you're trying to get a performer to do is break a performance practice that has been drilled into them uh, through all of their education, it can be hard. Um, I, my experience is with percussionists where I want them to hit the crown of the cymbal with a soft mallet, and it makes a dull thud. So it's not very audible, so you have to hit it real hard. So you're making this dull thud that's really loud by hitting it really hard, and they're really resistant because they want to figure out a way to make things ring and get reverberance, you know, and that's, that's what they're trained to do. And getting them to do the dull thud was like pulling teeth. Which yeah, is why... They don't want to do which, the dull thud. Which is why using English in your scores as a way to describe that what, what you want is always the way to go, if you're writing for English speakers, I guess. This symbol, this symbol means, means a doll thud. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Well, um, I had I had one last thing uh, about theory, Rick, and this wasn't in our our, our preamble things that it just occurred to me. Um, there's a uh, the idea of big data is something that is talked about in a lot of domains um, these days, and I wonder if you have any thoughts on or any uh, insights into. Um, I know that there's been some study done like where they enter the first, you know, the opening phrase of every Bach piece ever written, and then they do an analysis of the intervallic movements that it makes, and that's sort of like big number crunching. Um, is there anything like that that you know of that's interesting? I think that's all interesting. Um, and in fact, there is a, a professor at Princeton by the name of Dmitry Tomashko who's very into that and has graduate students encoding Bach pieces and Mozart piano sonata movements and so forth, and they're generating lots of numbers. Uh, but I'm reminded of my um, computer programming days of GIGO, which is short for garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> so right. what's the point of a statistical average? This is the average way of doing things. Pieces of music we're interested in that we want to perform, that we want to hear, and that we hope to write, are anything but typical and average, unless right, we're doing right. unless we're doing a play on the typical and the average, as as itself a kind of game. So um, while it may provide us with some in, lots and lots of information, and perhaps a nugget here or there, it's useful. It doesn't help us if our interest is in dealing with individual artworks. 
where this is most interesting is, I think, for movie music composing and for jingle writers and that kind of stuff, because after all, that's exactly what they are interested in, mm -hmm. is manipulating uh, common average situations in certain ways for fun and profit. So big data is great for those folks. But if you're not interested in that market, then uh, the utility of that is far more limited than we might hope. Again, giggle. <laughs> well, well, this this has been a very interesting conversation. Pretty nerdy um, conversation. Go us. <laughs> <It's> wonderful. <laughs> yeah. um, are we ready to move on to the news? Let's do it. All right. Um, <clears throat> feel free to chime in whenever you'd like. I wanted to get this first one out of the way because we have to say something about it, but it is so ridiculous. Um, I have it in the, the show order as giant face palm. Village Voice came out with an article, and it was two weeks ago or so now, and it's the titled "The Ten Most Bangable Members of the New York Philharmonic." And I agree. And we should with give Tom Cowell credit <laughs> for this. I, so, so you mean bang on a can, right? Yeah, he, not quite. I, That's exactly what we mean. <laughs> I agree with friend of the show Drew McManus that this is a new low in uh, classical music journalism, even for for a a, a a publication like the Village Voice. For, for the record, we do know that it was a joke. We still just think it was a terrible joke. Okay. Yes. I, I don't. I think Drew got a little out of hand on this. Okay, explain <laughs> was, yourself. Because I was just like I was reading his post about it. And I was like. Who cares? Like, I, he got all upset. Like, whatever. It's just a thing online. It's a thing online that no one should be upset about. Well, and that's enough about it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it says more about the person writing it. And right. They have, to, they have to deal with that. And that's great. I think that's just. Well, he's trying to make a joke about how classical music isn't sexy and whatever. It's, but as Drew pointed out, it could have been a lot funnier and a lot less stupid if he used either fake musicians or a fake orchestra but these are like real musician headshots from the new yorkville website that's the issue i have you know the so i wonder how i wonder how many of these people like were either flattered or disgusted by this i don't or, know that'd be interesting to find out interesting after this, this. <laughs> i think probably some of them were both flattered and disgusted yes. yeah, right. yeah. Can, right. can, i think um, walk it's gum. a big whatever yeah we, we covered recently that the Steinway had sold um, uh, its, 57th, its 57th Street showroom to a private equity firm. And now we find out that Steinway and Sons itself is going to be purchased by, is it the same private equity firm or do we know? I, I think it's somebody else. I think these are invest. So the other people were, were property developers. They are going to build a condo in the Steinway facility. Uh, these... I, I think it's a different group that is just buying it as an investment. Yep. Well, a four hundred and thirty-eight million dollar deal. Uh, the firm Kohlberg and Company <clears throat> is buying Steinway and Sons, and uh, you know this kind of thing happens a lot. Um, I think that everybody's just worried that, um, as is the case with a lot of. Uh, Companies that get bought out, they really change their manufacturing process and their, uh, you know, the product quality suffers. Um, it just seems like Steinway and Sons is such a, a firm fixture in the music pantheon that any company would be crazy to do anything besides let them keep doing what they do. Um, so it's a point of interest, but uh, we'll have to see if anything changes. And I'm quite certain that um, considering where they are and how many people are interested, if things start changing for the bad, we will hear about it. Uh, we should say, uh, an, again, an un unrelated, 72-year-old uh, brand name tenor, Placido Domingo, uh, was hospitalized this past Monday with a, an embolism in Madrid, Spain. Uh, he's canceled a few upcoming performances, though he did just yesterday, as we're recording this Saturday, uh, tweet and Facebook post that he is, is, is leaving the hospital. So he is on his way home and on the road to recovery. Uh, we wish him a speedy recovery and uh, continued success. He's, he's 72 years old, uh, and he is, he is still alive and kicking. He was going to be performing 
uh, an opera by Daniel Catan. Uh, so he's doing doing not just uh, the old Simone Bocanegra, but some some newer things as well. So yep. Uh, sad to hear that that he he's having those problems, but we're glad to hear that he's on the road to recovery. And I'm sure he's watching right now. So Placido, get well fast. Right, right. Yeah. Break away. Um, yeah, we've we've had a discussion on the show uh, in months past about um, many people have talked about this the uh, NEA versus uh, Kickstarter and who has raised more money. Um, this came up again uh, this week because of um, at the Aspen Institute. Not to be confused a, with the Aspen Music Festival, by, right. by the way. Um, at the Aspen Institute, somebody brought it up during a talk, and so it's become a, a, a point of uh, it become a topic that people are talking about again. The interesting thing that is made, the interesting issue that's raised in this article to me, has to do with the fact that. Sure, Kickstarter is raising more money, and we can say that because we can look at their books and say it's X amount of dollars versus the NEA. But you know, the thing that they point out is that Kickstarter money comes from individuals. It's just a different way of, of uh, you know, lowering the cost of entry, so to speak, for the individual to be a funder of art. But it's still coming from individuals, and individual donations have always outpaced the NEA as far as funding arts projects. Yeah. Um, 300 and uh, what is it? 323.6 million dollars of arts-related projects. So um, I, I question their definition of arts-related well, projects. A lot of these things are not the sorts of things that the, that the NEA is going to be funding. For example, yeah, they include design. This, 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 this awesome. was a design project. This watch that I'm wearing, the NEA is not going to give a grant to anybody to design a smartwatch. That's just <laughs> not the things that they do. It's certainly a creative pursuit, and I'm glad that someone is 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 supporting that kind of thing. But and and in fact, Kickstarter founder Perry Chen in this conversation actually says at one point that he doesn't see these two things as competing. They they can be very complementary, and I think that's how they are acting now. Um, uh, there are certainly some projects on Kickstarter that maybe could have been funded in part through uh, a sub-grant of the NEA, but one big difference is that the NEA doesn't have these individual grants anymore. They haven't for, you know, 30 years or so. Um, but things like, uh, you know, these, these recordings that we talk about on the show all the time, um, they could have been funded through, you know, several sub-grants down of the NEA, but... Maybe it's just faster and easier to, to go to Kickstarter these days. Um, it's cert- I, I shouldn't say easy because it's 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 not easy to have a successful Kickstarter campaign. But they're they're very different processes, and they <laughs> they fund different kinds of projects, and they can they can coexist, and we can all be happy. Yeah, uh, it's, it's we should nearly... still, however, be embarrassed at the small amount of money that the government spends on arts funding. That's that's not to say that we shouldn't be embarrassed about that. Right. It is. It's gotten. Uh, it's not as easy to f- have a successful Kickstarter project these days because people. I think the, the arts population is suffering from Kickstarter fatigue. Um, you know, once once some people hit it with Kickstarter, everyone has a Kickstarter project. So um, they're they're quite ubiquitous now. I wonder what the and I'm sure the numbers are out there. The funded versus unfunded percent percentages are on kickstarter these you can, days you can look kickstarter is very open about all of that kind of data and they leave the unfunded projects up so you can see when you search for a thing how whether a project has been funded or not um and it's, if it's been like resubmitted or something like that so you can you can certainly go look at that stuff quick plug you should all go back uh michael lowenstern has a sweet kickstarter project running right now to record the 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 rubank uh, kind of pedagogical solo clarinet, solo bass clarinet book, uh, and and make like kind of really good recordings of this rep that a lot of students are studying, but good recordings don't exist of for for bass clarinet and piano. And uh, I think he's also doing like a kind of music minus one, just the piano part for for students to practice with. So a very cool project. Uh, and Michael Lowenstern's a very cool guy. So. Anyway. And a hoss of a bass clarinet player. Exactly. I was I was gonna say I don't know if he's already done this, but it would be a lovely Kickstarter project for him to mass market his suspender bass clarinet neck strap. <laughs> you haven't seen these; they're great. You can use it for with or without bass clarinet. I take it. 
<laughs> yes. Yeah, it looks nice. It looks nice. You can wear it after Labor Day. Um, it only comes in black right now, though. Right. How would that work in the city? <laughs> well, Patrick has unfortunately had to leave us. You can see we're looking at uh, Patrick's desk right now. Uh, he had he had to go to work. Uh, but you get something. sound notion. You get sound notion cred for taking a stab at Patrick, though, even though he's not. Yeah. Here. That's right. He's Remember, not. Go ahead. Inquiring minds want to know. That's yeah, right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, so we've had a lot of stories about um, live webcasting of symphony concerts and operas, and uh, well, it's not an entirely new thing. Uh, there's an article in the New York Times this week about jazz clubs getting on the webcasting bandwagon, and I think this is a fantastic idea. I had no idea that this content was out there. Uh, a founded in 1994 a club uh, Smalls in in the village, Greenwich, Greenwich Village, has started uh, webcasting. Not it's Wednesday. Yeah, started webcasting its Wednesday night Wednesday night shows, and in addition to that, they're going to keep an archive uh, of that material that you can also um, look at. Right now, the webcast concerts are free but i think they have plans to make these the archive a pay service um but to me this is a an absolute fantastic idea it in in, in if you it, the the startup costs for getting a technically acceptable you know way of doing it so that it sounds and looks good is far lower than what you're going to have to do for the Met or whatever. So oh, yeah. um, I think this is a great idea, and I can't wait to see some of this stuff myself. Well, and, and in some ways, that's kind of what the Met is doing now. You can tune into the, the radio broadcast or the PBS broadcast uh, for free, but you can also pay, I think it's something like $15 a month, to Met Opera On Demand and watch all of their archived videos and even archived audio from before they were doing streaming video uh, back to the the it, probably at least the '60s, maybe earlier, um, and it's it's a really cool thing if you really love what the Met does. And I think that there is a a market for this. There are enough people who would be really interested in what uh, a jazz club in New York, especially for those of us like me that live far enough from New York that we'd never ever get to go see these things. And that's to me the 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 really amazing thing is that I don't live there and I would never get to you know consume this music any other way yes um it should be noted that they're they they're working with a a lawyer to figure out a good way of paying musicians um musicians can opt out of being in the archive hopefully they won't um but they're gonna if there's gonna be a pay scale based on the number of minutes that you're on you know, like, so if you show up and you're, you know, you play the first set with the group or whatever, then they count up the number of minutes and then you get paid based on your actual time on screen, if you will. Um, and of course, we don't know exactly what that's going to be. They're still figuring it out. But the important thing is that they're they're considering everything, including the legal ramifications and getting the musicians paid and everything from the beginning. It sounds like it has good... the potential to be quite the legal hot mess. <laughs> Could be. Could be. Well, and holy crap. Holy crap, indeed. Guess how old John Zorn is. I don't know, 45? <laughs> I was thinking 37. <laughs> no. <laughs> At the beginning of September, he will turn 60. No. Yes. You're and lying to, honor, to me. <laughs> and to honor him, uh, there is a a series of events going on in the city. Um, there's already been a concert uh at the Guggenheim, and I think coming up this weekend, is it? Uh, Patrick said he might be going to it. There's going to be a, uh, at, at Lincoln Center, there's going to be a concert of his music. If you want to follow it uh, on the social medias, uh, you can Zorn at 60 um, on, on the Twitter um, Anyway, there's not a lot to say, except it's interesting that uh, someone who's kind of been, you know, uh, intentionally positioning himself on the fringes and an and an outsider and and trying to genre splice as much as possible it seems like the the genre splicing aesthetic has caught up with him and he's being accepted in you know he's being let to the grown-ups table even yeah <laughs> um big fan of john zorn i've seen him uh play live one time and it was a remarkable experience he can play the hell
hell out of a saxophone and can circular breathe like nobody's business. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Anybody ever seen him live? No, I've always wanted to, though. Yeah. It's a, he's, uh, Pat Metheny has a new album out, and I can't remember the name of it. I'll put it in the notes, though, that is a, a big piece of his. That's like a uh, sort of an album-length piece that he recorded of John Zorn's. Fantastic. Fantastic. And we have a, an obit this week. Um, a lot of people may not have heard of this guy, but I bet we've all listened to products of his labors uh, Amar G. Bose, acoustic engineer and inventor, dies at 83. He was one of these. Um, he, he was not like a, a music person. He was just an engineer. He taught at MIT, and he thought mm-hmm. we can do this this speaker thing better. We can we can make sounds electronically better than we have been before. And right. He started a company. He taught at MIT for like 45 years or something like that. For a really a long, long time. time. And and one of these founders that remained really involved in in the product um, yes you know he it was, was very hands-on throughout his career with bose it was always a privately held company too so he didn't have to he could invest a lot of money over a long period of time and not have to have the board or stockholders or anybody else yelling at him that you need to get off this and move on to something that'll make us more money hence we have you know uh, he came up with a system through that kind of research. Now, uh, you know, you find his his systems in cars everywhere, and we have noise canceling headphones, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we've all heard products of his labors, and um, I would imagine we'll continue to. I imagine for quite some time we will continue to. Let's hope uh, that in some way he can be uh, replaced with someone with a very similar mindset. Yeah. We would hope so, or that the company continues, uh, yeah. you know, in his uh, following his example, mm-hmm. and 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 keeps uh, keeps its sort of independent leanings so that it can keep innovating. Yeah, I think. Well, and I think after um, you know, web and mobile startups, another tech startup space that's very exciting is hardware startups. People are like making things, which is really interesting. Yeah, yeah, um, it's getting easier know. to do so. Yeah, Absolutely. thanks to Kickstarter, callback. Hey. Uh, so it's time now, Sam. <laughs> for the for pick, the pick, pick, pick of, the of the week. week. Our pick of the week this week, we've been talking about it all, already, is by our guest, Rick Herman. Uh, so, uh, Rick, do you want to uh, maybe introduce, say a little bit about this piece before uh, before we take a listen? Uh, sure. One way of um, listening to it, if you like, is as a, uh, a really fine violinist uh, in his or her study, sort of improvising and remembering bits of the past, and maybe they're also a bit of a composer, and doing bits of recent pasts. And you can think of it as a bit of a stream of conscious piece, if you like. Uh, there are many paths in it. Uh, violinists hear it in a very different way, of course, because it has little tiny bit quotes from uh, their unaccompanied repertoire. And uh, perhaps you'll pick out the lament bass uh, references, which are basically everywhere. It'll probably smack you in the face. In any event, it's a quite athletic piece in some ways, yeah. but I don't think uh, its emphasis is on athleticism. I think it is on uh, the ideas uh, yeah. And, yeah. and in service of the ideas. I hope you uh, enjoy it. And David Felberg is the performer that I worked very closely with. Uh, and he's done a great job. And he'll have a, a commercial recording of that out uh, sometime. We're, we're in the late editing stages of it. Excellent. He'll have a CD of unaccompanied violin pieces, Excellent. including some of the ones I quote. So here, here it is, an excerpt from Remembering by our guest Rick Herman.
So that was uh, an excerpt from Remembering by our guest Rick Herman, performed by David Feldberg. So thank you, Rick, very much for sharing that. And of course, people can uh, uh, stream this whole thing on your on your website. Is that correct? I think so. Yeah. So oh, I know so. <laughs> would encourage you all to do that because it's a it's a really cool piece. Um, thank thanks thanks again for sharing it. Um, I, those those little moments of lament bass that you you mentioned uh, are are really interesting. When I think of unaccompanied violin repertoire, it uh, evokes ideas of Baroque and, and pre Baroque music. Uh, I think is kind of the first place I think of for unaccompanied violin, unaccompanied cello, things like that. Um, so I think the, the, the lament bass is, is another thing that I associate with that, that period. Um, and, and as I said before, it strikes me that this is a very violinish piece that it, it couldn't be performed on another instrument. And you, you mentioned the amazing, uh, what I like to think of as violin calisthenics that, uh, that you hear throughout this piece is very, it is very athletic, um, and, and very well performed by uh, David Feldberg, that the the the, uh, the harmonics are so crystal clear. There's, it, which is amazing because you so often hear those as not quite locked in. I don't know, Nate. You're you're a. I keep doing this like I know what this means. <laughs> that's a live performance too. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, right. That's the that's the exciting thing to hear at the end is the applause. Yeah. You're like, oh wow, that's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great. And the, the the calculation of the broken, uh, broken quadruple stops and stuff. So it it seemed really carefully worked out. Which it's interesting to hear that you notated that so specifically as well. I, I felt it necessary to the effect, and it was a great privilege working with David. Uh, by the time he got around to recording it, we had something like sixteen or seventeen hour long rehearsals, working out all the issues involved. Wow. So he was very, very dedicated. I'm very, very fortunate to have such a, a wonderful musician with an open mind like that playing the piece and helping me with it. That's wonderful. I mean, I know I've I've worked with a lot of <laughs> like so as a composer. I'm a viola player myself, yeah, so. and I going going through school, working with different string players, and just practicing next to somebody working on some new piece. I. My experience, especially with things like that, where it's <laughs> they might have a question about how exactly to break it or how how what what exactly this harmonic should be or what the different strategies of which strings to use and everything, and like that that seems most most people I've talked to like have all these questions and then just kind of pick something. And to to them, I imagine it must have been a luxury to just like. I can ask, get a clear answer, and <laughs> and yeah. have have it be really right, you know. The the other interesting thing about modern string technique, at least on the violin, is they have a great preference for shifting. Mm -hmm. And this piece is not about. I mean, it does have lots of spots where you have to do a lot of shifting, but it has a lot of spots where you have to cross strings, which is an older Baroque technique. And of course, guitarists are very familiar with that. They tend to go across strings and not shift up when they can. Mm -hmm. So I must admit, I did take several semesters of violin lessons in college, and I did have a lot of guitar background. So coming in, I had uh, some idea of what I was doing with the fiddle, but I think working with David uh, kicked me off several levels, several notches in my ability to understand at least the violin. Uh, the viola really is a different animal, as you know. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, I, it was came quite a shock to me. Uh, that became very clear to me when I wrote uh, several years later a solo viola piece. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, the variability of those instruments is so extreme that uh, some very very small violists, if you have very long skinny fingers, you can go up and go past the the upper bout. But yeah, if you yeah. have a big viola or small hands, you can't. And right, so right. that automatically is a variable you don't have with the violin. And it's a significant one. Mm -hmm. And and then if you tread into that land of uh, having, <laughs> like just covering larger distances, one of my viola teachers kept, uh, like I've got pretty big hands and my viola isn't super huge, so I, I, can, I can reach a lot of things that like earlier teachers I had didn't, but 
uh, <laughs> my teacher I've been studying with most recently, he keeps telling me like, you know, it's only an inch, this, <laughs> this shift or, or, and things like that. And, uh, but yeah, so like the shift could be so done, executed in so many different ways that sounds so different. It can really, really change a piece. And, and, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah, I, as I think Sam was saying earlier that this is so many, some, some string players do have the attitude that these are the choices that they have been training themselves, like they've been doing all this research, so they should be able to make those choices. Um, but, like, obviously, if you if you have a piece and you have an idea, then right. <laughs> well, it's piece. it's clearly a compositional decision, right? Right. Exactly. I mean, the the string crossings really are you know lend itself to the clarity of the the counterpoint that's going on right the the different lines exist in these different in these different spaces that are set apart by the different strings right one of the ways i deal with that kind of recalcitrance or shall i say it uh, needless adherence to a dead tradition mm. is to <laughs> say to people well why don't you just try it this way i, I want to know how this this works it's you know kind of educating me why you know why well, it could be done this way or that way and sometimes that can get some of these folks to come out of their shell and try something else in the guise of educating me. Right. Of course, usually I have a pretty good idea of what I'm about. <laughs> yeah, you know they're going to like. So you're a con artist, basically. <laughs> That's Remember, art's root is artifice. So we are all con men and women, if you take it from the definition. <laughs> well, that, I like that. I like that. I think maybe that's a maybe that's a good place to leave it for this week. Remember, you're all con men. Everyone, everyone here on the show, unless you're a con woman. Unless yeah, you're right. a con woman. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's going to do it for this week's Sound Notion. Thank you, Rick Herman, so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure talking to you this week, uh, and uh, we we hope to have you have you back on the show sometime uh, to to talk about maybe this recording when this recording comes out. Well, that would be fun. I would enjoy it. And uh, it's, it's good to uh, get to know you, if only a little bit. And, uh, yeah, that would be great to, to continue. Um, this show had a lot of different stories, and we will have links to all of those different stories. Uh, Sam will be putting together, as usual, our brilliant program notes. Uh, and you can read all of them and get links to all of these stories on our site, soundnotion.tv slash sn. Um, you can also connect with us in all of the social internet things. Uh, you can like us on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter. You can subscribe to us on YouTube. If you have a story that you would like to suggest for the show, you can tweet it with ash hashtag SNWeekly. Uh, you can also tweet at us uh, uh, with Twitter mentions. We're at Sound Notion as a group. I'm at Dave McDow. Sam is at Houseboy. <laughs> Patrick, who's no longer with us, is at Vox Shibuya. Nate is at a Nate tree. Uh, and so we would love to continue these conversations. If you have a, a strong feeling about Amar G. Bose or about uh, string crossings, we would love to, to talk about them <laughs> after after the fact. Uh, you can subscribe to us in the iTunes store. Uh, all of our podcasts are <laughs> subscribable in the iTunes store and catch every episode downloaded to your favorite device. Um, if you'd like to support the show, you can use the Amazon affiliate search box on, our, on the right side of any of the pages on our site. Whatever you're buying for Amazon, just search for it there. Uh, and then when you check out, it's not going to look any different to you, but we'll get a little commission and that helps us out a lot. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for those of you who have already done that. Um, Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching and we will see you back next week.